I want to take a look at a couple of different kinds of motion. Uh, the first of those will be dependent motion, and then we'll look at relative motion immediately after. Dependent motion is motion of an object usually being pulled by a cable or a rope or something like that. And it could be more than one object being pulled by a cable or a rope. And the idea is that the motion of one object depends on the movement of that cable or perhaps on the movement of another object or a couple of more objects. So let's kind of take a look at this uh, with a real simple example. So here we have objects A and B. These are two blocks. And you can see that block B is attached to a cable and block A is attached to the same cable. All right, so the movement of block A, if I move block B rather to the right, clearly block A is also going to move to the right. But the question mark then becomes, how does the velocity of block B compare with the velocity of block A? Or how does the acceleration of block B compare with the acceleration of block A? And so in order to answer that question, what we really want to do is we start off by looking at the cable itself. All right, so this is a single piece of rope. It starts here, and it moves to block B, then around this cable pulley here, and then to another pulley at block A, another pulley at this wall, and finally ends at block A. So in this particular example, the length of the cable is a constant. Now, in many examples, it won't be. It'll be winding up. In any scenario, there is a length of the cable. And that length of the cable is what we're going to begin with. But in order to define that length, I need to do a couple of other things first. I need to set up, first off, a coordinate system. Now, this is strictly one-dimensional, so we're just going to have an x. And we're going to let this have x equal to 0 at this point. We can put x equal to 0 anywhere. But I'm going to choose this left end to make my life simple. Then, this point at the edge of A will be the position of block A. And we're not going to worry about the fact that this pulley is not right at the edge. For all intents and purposes, the position of that pulley right here is XA. And then we'll do the same thing. We'll put this at the middle of the pulley. It doesn't really matter. We're going to call that XB. And we're also going to need to designate this point right here. And I'm going to call that XP for the pulley. All right, so these are the three positions. So how can I write the length of the cable based on these three positions? Well, we're going to start off with, oh, we'll make this red segment right here. And the length of that is XB. Okay, keep in mind the left side here is at zero. The right side is at XB. So the length of the cable is XB. And then, so that's the red portion, then there's the orange portion right here, and that's going to be XB minus XA. So I'm going to add to XB the length XB minus XA. There's the orange portion, and then there's this green portion right here. And the length of that is xp minus xa. So we add to that xp minus xa. And finally, there's the purple portion. And that's also xp minus xa. So this equation then represents the entire length of the cable. All right, so I've got xb, xb, all right, so that's 2xb, and then I have minus xa, minus xa, minus xa, so minus 3xa, and finally xp and xp plus 2xp. So there is the length of this cable. Now in this particular example, the length of the cable is fixed. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but what I want to do is take advantage of the fact that I can find the derivative of the length of the cable with respect to time. Now, if there was, say, a pulley system here that was winding up the cable, the derivative of the length of the cable with respect to time would have some non-zero value. But for our problem, 
the derivative of the length of the cable with respect to time is zero. For some of the homework problems you're going to be doing, that won't be true. It'll be some given value, but here it's equal to zero. Well, so I've taken the derivative of the left-hand side. Well, what you do to the left, you do to the right. So that's going to equal the derivative with respect to time of 2xb minus 3xa plus 2xp. But the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. So this is the derivative with respect to time of 2xb minus the derivative with respect to time of 3xa plus the derivative with respect to time of 2xp. But of course xp isn't moving. And so the derivative with respect to time of xp, that's going to be 0. So only these two terms are left over. But the derivative of xb with respect to time is xb dot, or the velocity of b. And the derivative of xa with respect to time is xa dot, which is the velocity of a. And so I can rewrite this entire equation as 0 equals, looking at this term here, 2xb dot. And then this term here, minus 3xa dot. Or I could write that as 2 times the velocity of a, excuse me, 2 times the velocity of b, minus 3 times the velocity of a. All of that's equal to 0. And again, if, if L is not constant, then I have to know what is the rate at which L is changing. Uh, so dL dt in that scenario would not be equal to 0. But in this scenario it is. And so I can write 2 times the velocity of b equals 3 times the velocity of a or the velocity of b is 3 halves the velocity of a. So if a is moving at, uh, I think they even gave us one of those, let's see, b is moving with 6 inches per second, so this is 6 inches per second, then the velocity of a must be 2 thirds of that, which is 4 inches per second. In a similar fashion, I can take the derivative of both sides of this equation with respect to time, or this equation, and I would get the acceleration of b equals 3 halves the acceleration of a. So that gives me the relationship between these two velocities, these two accelerations. One depends on the other. So that's what we mean by dependent motion. All right, continuing on then, let's talk about relative motion. And relative motion is really easily done if we keep in mind the idea of notation. So if I'm talking about the position of B relative to A, keep in mind now this is a vector quantity. So the position of B with respect to A, let's take a look at this grid here. All right, so here's A and here is B. So if I was sitting in a chair, let's say these are your chairs at your tables or your desks, if you're A and B and I'm B, then the position of me with respect to you, well, you would say that I am 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 blocks or sections or seats to the left. So that would be minus 6 in the i direction, and then down 1, minus 1 in the j direction. So the position of b relative to a, and I can draw that as a vector, it's not a very good one. I can draw that as a, a vector quantity. The position of b with respect to a is minus 6 to the left, well, 6 to the left, and 1 down. And so there's that vector quantity. If, on the other hand, I was interested in Oh, let's say the position of S relative to B. All right, and here's S. Where do I see S 
S is one, two, three blocks to the right, one, two blocks down, minus two J. So that's the position of S relative to B. Now notice if I said, well, what's the position of S relative to A? That would be one, two, three to the left, one, two, three down. So minus three, that's three to the left, minus three J, that's three down. But if I look at this as vectors, then the position of B relative to A plus the position of S relative to B as a vector, that must be the position of S relative to A. All right, so I would say it this way. The position of B relative to A plus the position of S relative to B equals the position of S relative to A. And you'll see that's the case. If I add these two terms together, negative 6 plus 3, just looking at the I terms, negative 6 plus 3 is negative 3. Negative 1 plus negative 2 is negative 3 in the J direction. So indeed, this is correct. But take a look at the subscripts. I have B over A, S over B on the left-hand side, S over A on the right-hand side. But those B's kind of cancel if you think of the subscripts being multiplied. So I can always figure out how to add the vector quantities together by looking at the subscripts. Notice also if I said, well, what is the position of A relative to B? B would say A is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 segments to the right, one segment down, or up rather, which is exactly the opposite of that. So the position of A relative to B is equal to 6i plus 1j, which is exactly opposite the position of B relative to A. So one thing to keep in mind, if you switch the order of your subscripts, you bring a minus sign into, into bearing here. So you want to keep that in mind as you're looking at, at relative motion. All right. So let's just rewrite this again. BA plus SB. Uh, right here. So the position of B with respect to A plus the position of S with respect to B is equal to the position of S with respect to A. In a similar fashion, I can take the derivative of both sides, and I'll get the velocity of B with respect to A, plus the velocity of S with respect to B, equals the velocity of S with respect to A. I'll also get the acceleration of B with respect to A, plus the acceleration of S with respect to B, equals the acceleration of S with respect to A just by taking another time derivative. All of these will work just fine with our subscripts, whether it's position, velocity, or acceleration. The subscripts are all the same. It's B over A, S over B. The B's cancel, and you're left with S over A.